My name is Hannah Reuter, and I am a policy manager here at Japan North America, and I manage our US healthcare delivery initiative, which we call HCDI. And we are so delighted to have the opportunity to organize today's discussion alongside our colleagues from um, JPL North America's state and local innovation initiative. Um, so just sort of generally speaking, who is HCDI? What do we do? Um, HCDI uh, catalyzes and spurs and supports randomized evaluations of strategies that aim to improve healthcare delivery here in the United States with the aim of making things more efficient, effective, and equitable for all. Um, so for those of you joining us today, some of you may have joined um, some of these previous webinars. This is the fourth and final webinar uh, in a series called Charting the Next Decade of Evidence Generation in State and Local Government. Um, recordings are available of previous webinars, so if you missed those discussions and you'd like to learn more about these topics, uh, previous webinars discussed things like uh, uh, research on climate justice and environmental justice, thinking about how to incorporate a qualitative perspective into randomized evaluations, as well as thinking really uh, specifically about how to incorporate uh, racial equity in evaluations that state and local governments are doing. And so today's discussion is about uh, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the current health crisis that we all find ourselves in. Um, I think we're on, you know, month eight now, um, and state and local governments are really grappling with how to deal with this crisis, you know, efficiently and, and equitably. And so um, turning to today, I'm really excited to have three incredible speakers joining us. Uh, so the first is Dr. Marcella Alsun. She is a professor of public policy at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and she's also the co-chair of HCDI. Um, her research focuses on the relationship between health and socioeconomic disparities with an emphasis on infectious disease. And she uses randomized evaluations to explore historical public health, natural experiments, and the interactions between infectious disease, human capital, and economic outcomes. So another speaker who will be joining us today is Dr. Owen Garrick. He is the president and CEO of Bridge Clinical Research, a global clinical research and health communications firm focused on drug development, scientific advancement, and patient engagement. As a nationally recognized leader in research and research ethics, he also serves as an advisor to the Stanford Precision Health for Ethnic and Racial Equity Center, SPHERE, and is a member of the National Genome Research Institute's Genomic Education of Healthcare Professionals Partnership. And our last, not last speaker, our third speaker today is Mona Shaw. She'll be sort of moderating our conversation today. She's a senior program officer uh, in the Research Evaluation and Learning Unit at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. As both a researcher and expert in health policy, Shaw, Mona Shaw is involved in the process of understanding and measuring key health and healthcare issues essential to the foundation's overarching strategy to move our nation toward a culture of health. And we are so delighted to have them here today. I think this is going to be a really fantastic discussion. We only have the privilege of, their of, of having them speak with us today for an hour. So I'm going to be really brief and just sort of share basic high level um, ground rules and the overview for today. So as I said, we have 60 minutes. Uh, so I will turn things over in a moment to Mona Shaw to share some framing remarks about why we're here today, why this issue is so critically important. Um, who will then turn it over to uh, Professor Olson, who's going to share a short presentation on um, some research that she did actually with her co-panelist, Dr. Owen Garrick, and other research on sort of questions of um, racial equity and healthcare delivery. Um, and, you know, last but not least, we're going to save about 10 or 15 minutes for audience questions. And so uh, if you'd like to ask a question at any time throughout the webinar, please feel free uh, to put that in the in the chat box and we'll be um, we'll be looking at those and going through them at the very end. So um, thanks again so much for joining us. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand things over to Mona. Hi, uh, thanks, Hannah. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining the conversation. I want to first thank the JPEL team for inviting me to this event and their commitment for bringing evidence based knowledge to change makers to help inform decisions that protect and support communities across the country, especially the most vulnerable. So, today's panel, Responding to COVID 19 Pandemic and Improving Health Equity, is so timely and important, especially now. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's vision for a culture of health requires that we address barriers for health and well being. These barriers to health that we've seen through both evidence and talking to people with lived experience include factors like poverty, racial, racial and gender discrimination, lack of access to healthcare services and providers, lack of 
uh, stable housing, and lack of access to good and healthy food options. What has come to the forefront with COVID-19 and something we as a nation can't can ignore is not everyone in this country has a fair and just opportunity to health and well-being. We also need to acknowledge the connection between health and racism and address the underlying reasons for the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 um, on communities and colors. So at Robert Johnson Foundation, I'm fortunate to be able to work with experts like researchers who are part of the JPL network investigating how the conditions that people are born into affect their health and well-being. The evidence tells us factors like where a person lives, their race, or how much money they earn can have implications on their opportunity to live a healthy life. As Hannah mentioned, the, hand, the pandemic illuminates these inequities that existed long before 2020. And we have a moral obligation as a country to use this crisis to enact more equitable policies that change our society for the better. There's abundance of strong data and research decision, decision makers like yourself can turn to as, as you seek evidence-based policies that support everyone's health while reducing health disparities. So take, for example, before the pandemic, close to half of the country's lowest wage workers didn't have access to paid uh, sick leave. Uh, RWJF funded research showed that paid sick leave benefit in the CARES Act flattened the COVID curve over the summer. Another issue that's top of mind for everyone, including myself, who, have a, who has a first grader downstairs, hopefully, on school um, is parents and caregivers struggling to ensure their children are able to keep their um, keep up with school during this time. And recent researchers from JPL show that online tutoring improves disadvantaged school uh, school students' performance and well-being during the lockdown. So we encourage uh, legislators and policymakers and change makers to continue to turn to that research like this to design and enact policies that protect the people people facing the most significant health, economic, and social challenges of our lifetime. And resources like JPAL provide reliable data and guidance to support your work. And one of those experts um, that's part of the JPAL network is Dr. Marcy Allison. Um, and I'll turn it to her to talk about her research and findings. Okay, great. Apologies for that. I was having trouble unmuting myself. Can, can folks hear me now? Great. Okay, um, so thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, for that generous introduction. Um, I will be sharing some evidence that uh, I've helped to generate alongside um, Dr. Owen Garrick, who is another speaker, as Hannah mentioned. Um, and so I think I'll start with what motivated the work with Dr. Garrick, which is what my colleague at uh, Harvard Kennedy School, Cornell Brooks, I just wanna make sure. Okay, what my colleague at Kennedy School, Cornell Brooks, who is a former past president of the NAACP calls empirically based mistrust. So along with Marianne Wanamaker, we studied the effect of the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. In the disclosure of that study, um, when it was finally revealed uh, that it was occurring by a whistleblower to the media, we studied how that disclosure event affected the health-seeking behavior, trust in medical institutions and medical professionals, and health outcomes for African-American men. Um, so the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male was the official title of that study, which was carried out um, by the CDC under the PHS, the um, Public Health Services. And uh, it really, the title tells you pretty much everything you need to know. The study was carried out in Tuskegee, Alabama. There were individuals that had syphilis and they were not to be treated. Um, and it specifically targeted black men. So we used uh, a non-randomized 
evaluation to look at how mistrust affected health outcomes and health behaviors, finding a drop in life expectancy, uh, which mirrored a drop in healthcare utilization following the whistleblower's revelation of these concerns. This is an example of a study that you would never want to try and randomize given the ethics of, of involved. So we leveraged the fact that there was this historical abhorrent episode of medical mistrust um, to kind of understand the effect it would have on healthcare demand. Obviously that was an extremely, um, extremely upsetting experience, uh, not only uh, for myself, but also for Mary Ann. And it really motivated me to try and uh, address disparities as opposed to the important work of documenting them, but how do we actually do the sort of work that, that Mona mentioned, Dr. Shaw mentioned, and try to address those disparities. So along with Dr. Garrick, we wanted to understand uh, since trust seems to be such a critical component of healthcare, and there are empirically based reasons for medical mistrust among, in this instance, Black Americans, um, would it be would it be possible that having a race concordant physician could make a difference? Um, and of course, we see reasons for medical mistrust not just related to the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, but there's many other historical instances that could have generated. Uh, mistrust in our medical institutions today. And we see some evidence that this mistrust still exists, even though the Tuskegee study um, that I mentioned only went up to the 1980s, still in the current day when Dr. Garrick and I were doing focus groups about preventative care in Oakland, men were very concerned about vaccines. Um, there was a feeling that potentially, uh, a narrative that potentially syphilis was injected into men um, although uh, it was a case control study. And so there was a, a real fear about, about injections and needles and whatnot. And, and we, we know that, it, you know, hopefully there will be an effective coronavirus vaccine and it should, we should prioritize those communities that are being hard hit and those frontline service providers, not just healthcare workers, but the custodial staff, the food service staff, the, the staff that are making the hospital and medical facilities run. Um, through deliveries and, and other types of ancillary care. Um, and we see those disparities play out in the death rates that are, you know, these are some numbers that we have, but you see a variety of numbers, 1.5, 2.1, 4.0, in terms of the, just the, the increase in, in case rates and hospitalization rates and fatality rates um, from COVID among African-American communities and among Latinx communities that are extremely troubling. But again, as Dr. Shaw mentioned, an extension of some of the patterns uh, that we know exist from before. So as I mentioned with Dr. Garrick, along with Grant Graziani, who um, was at the time a PhD student in uh, Berkeley, we wanted to understand given this history of mistrust, this empirically based mistrust, would having a concordant position matter? Would it improve the take up of preventative care which has that high, that's a low hanging fruit, high rate of return medical care for African-American men. We had a two stage design um, in the first stage. And importantly, we recruited from the community. It's actually Dr. Garrick's genius that suggested we um, recruit from barbershops, local barbershops in the area, maybe something we can talk about um, in the Q&A. But essentially it was a double blind randomized trial. Everyone who was involved in the study knew that the purpose was to improve the take up of preventative care for African-American men. What wasn't revealed to everyone was the fact that we were specifically looking at this dimension of race concordance. And we had two stages. The first stage, the patients were, subjects were introduced to the physician um, on a tablet. And that, and that physician was again, either a black or a non-black, i.e. white or, not, uh, or Asian male. Um, and they were allowed to select preventative services. Then in the second stage, they actually met with the doctor and could revise those services that they demanded and the doctor would provide the services right there in the pop-up clinic that Dr. Garrick and I created. Talk, going back to social determinants and some of the work of our WJF, you know, we quickly realized that simply getting to the clinic was not a foregone conclusion for a lot of these men. And so we were very fortunate through uh, connections at the business school, not ours, someone else's, to have Uber donate ride-sharing services that allowed the men to come easily to and from the clinic. 
And what we see was actually at the first stage, why did we have the first stage? Let me not get ahead of myself. And the preclinical stage is sort of your basic audit study. You might've seen in the headlines of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, um, evidence of discrimination of um, Airbnb or maybe in ride sharing services or in labor markets where uh, individuals uh, simply see on their screen a picture of a person or a name that might have uh, that might be more associated with one race or ethnicity versus another, and that can lead to lower, you know, lower job offers, lower, longer wait times for for being picked up by a ride sharing app, and also differences in you know in in whether or not you get the the um, the place to rent. So in, indeed, our first stage is basically an audit study to see whether there is a really strong preference for a certain group over another then patients just seeing a photo of the doctor that was going to be assigned to them should have differences in their demand for preventative care. But if it was really something not about snap judgments that people make on a photo, but rather something about the connection that you feel, the power of that clinical encounter and the communication that, that, um, that is required in order to have a successful production of, of help, then we wouldn't start to see differences until the second stage. And that's indeed what our study found. After the first stage, there were no differences in demand across patients that were assigned to black versus non-black physicians. There were 15 in, um, 14 rather in the study, 14 physicians. But it, after the patients actually got to meet their physician, that's where these gaps really widened. And they're particularly strong for even when we just noted on uh, that, that the cholesterol and diabetes re exams required a finger prick of blood. Um, so if you want to quote unquote call those invasive studies, that's really where a lot of the differences opened up. Um, and, and again, uh, when I presented this to some of my colleagues in the medical community, a, a surgeon raised her stand, hand and said, you, you know, you call a finger prick of blood invasive. How about trying to uh, how about trying to encourage someone to, to get a colonoscopy? Um, so I thought that that was an interesting point. These are probably, I think these are lower bound estimates for various reasons. First of all, you have to think about the selection of the doctors, the non-black doctors that were willing to participate in this and, and give their Saturdays to, to provide this care. And then of course, the fact that these are actually not fairly harmless, like fairly low risk um, preventative care that we're talking about here. So as I mentioned, the results really did seem to be driven by, um, by this communication during the event. And yet, um, yet the numbers of African-American physicians, particularly African-American male physicians, the number that are, uh, are being um, accepted into medical school, these, these rates are extremely low and have been constant really since the late 1970s with about uh, 500 or so matriculating every year, which is just a really low number. Um, and we've tried to, since that time, look at, you know, dealing with the fact that the stock of healthcare providers is what it is right now, is there things that we can train uh, non-Black providers? Is there different messaging strategies that we can use to try and achieve similar uh, results? And I'm going to just tell you up front that there are a lot of degrees of freedom in that type of work. Um, so I think there's, uh, you really have to be careful before you say something isn't successful. You really have to think about, um, have you really exhausted all the possible framings that you could have? Um, so one thing that we're doing right now, and unfortunately it's under, it's under uh, review at, uh, at, annals, um, at, a, at, a, at a medical journal, so we can't uh, show you the results, just yet, but we partnered with a diverse set of doctors from MGH, from the Centers for Diversity and Inclusion to have different forms of messaging um, and actually have different types of messengers. So classically in economics, if you're informed, you're either informed or you're not informed. And it doesn't really matter who's giving the signal, but from what we know uh, intuitively, and I think what we've seen a bit on the ground so far, that the messenger matters too. It has to be someone that's trusted um, and so we are trying to kind of use both physicians and then different types of physicians and among the Latinx community, importantly, giving the opportunity to have the message in Spanish. Finally, um, I should say that this most recent work that I'm doing 
is in Minnesota, where we're trying to, the Minnesota has done a fantastic job expanding their testing capacity for COVID-19. But again, that's underutilized and really communities that are hardest hit are not availing themselves of this opportunity. Now, one thing that we kind of wanted to talk to them, right, and, and I should say this was right before the death of George Floyd, where we started to discuss with them um, this low take up. So it preceded that. Um, at the time, in, in an effort to quickly scale up, um, to quickly scale up testing, they had employed the National Guard um, to provide testing services. And I think that's a, something that people are also talking about with vaccine service. And I think we have to think about how that appears to communities that have been heavily surveilled to have uniformed National Guards individuals providing sort of COVID ramp, being a part of the COVID response and, and whether that is the best way to, um, to, to actually be the face of the service. Um, and so basically what, we've, what we're doing in this study, which is just completed, is we, we did different frames about um, whether or not we kind of had the academic involvement highlighted or the state of Minnesota highlighted in our, in our quest to kind of provide information to the state and get, um, get information from individuals about their experiences with testing, with their experience with contact tracing. And because we were really interested in getting those underserved communities, we were able to partner with the state and local government in order to actually distribute our flyers at food shelves. And I think it's a really important and unfortunate thing um, that's happening right now that these food shelves are becoming so central in order to reach individuals and communities that are really hard hit right now. Um, and, that, and that is, I think, a really important distribution point. Um, lastly, I'll just say, you know, it's one of the, um, one of the strengths of JPAL is not just doing the work, funding the things that are, um, that are uh, you know, maybe a little bit risky or maybe outside the regular wheelhouse of, of uh, maybe traditional federal funding, but things that are extremely important nevertheless, and then trying to communicate those findings to individuals like you, to the change makers, to the policymakers, um, to the individuals that hold the reins. And so this is just some of the examples, one again with uh, Dr. Garrick, um, who is you know, really, uh, really excited to hear uh, what his thoughts on, on um, our time together and the things that he's been working on since, um, but also just thinking about applying these lessons to the current crisis of COVID, thinking about you know, who is the messenger, who's the face of the distributor, um, and what, where, how do we get information from the communities in real time, thinking about these points, thinking about churches, thinking about non-traditionally surveilled you know, places, trusted spaces, barbershops, um, et cetera, um, where we can try and actually reach people and, uh, and also hear from them, hear from them about their struggles. Um, so that's it uh, from my perspective. Thank you so much. And I'll, I, I look forward to talking more during the panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellison. Uh, and we're also joined by Dr. Owen Garrick for this question and answer portion. And just a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat uh, function so we could ask uh, Dr. Gar Garrick and Dr. Ellison um, questions about their uh, really important research. Um, Dr. Garrick, I think he's still on mute. So maybe we'll start the first question with Dr. Ellison. Um, so as you know, Black, Latino, Native, Ameri uh, Native American, um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 pandemic. And on top of this, the message around COVID-19 pandemic has been quite confusing. Can you speak a little bit um, about what your research suggests we should keep in mind when communicating about public health programs to ensure they're meeting the needs of communities of color? You know what? Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. I, I see Dr. Garrick is now unmuted, so let me let him have a chance to, to start that one. Oh, no, no, no. Feel free, please. I defer 
Well, actually, I don't know if you're my elder or not, but I defer to those that are much smarter than me. So please go ahead. Oh, you're back on mute. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kara, I could ask the question again. Um, so uh, as you know, many communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic right. and the messaging has been quite confusing. So as you, uh, as based on your research and your expertise, uh, what should we keep in mind when communicating about public health programs to ensure they're meeting the needs of communities of color? And thanks again for joining us. No, thank you. I appreciate you having me. So as, as Dr. Alston talked about that, you know, with the work we did, right? So if you, if you agree with that, you believe in the results, you know, a solution is just, you know, having lots of Black and Latinx and Native American clinicians and public health officials and personnel communicate directly, right? And for those um, uh, on the webinar, if you're a state government or state public health or county or district or city, and you have just plenty of diverse uh, healthcare workers around, um, you're in good shape, right? But for the rest of us, as um, uh, Dr. Olson mentioned, you know, there is this underrepresentation um, on the scientific, on the public health, on the clinician side. Uh, and so as we begin, as I think about, you know, what the framework might be for each individual uh, entity, you know, city, local, uh, state, um, you know, the, if you look at this issue of racial concordance, right, that really distills, I think, simply to the trusted messenger. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about this notion of communication, it is a message that resonates, right? And, you know, since we're, I'm sure, talking uh, to some economic audience, right, you know, there's this notion in our study around an incentive. So if there's a, if there's mistrust or distrust, you have to be able to break through whatever that burden or tax is. So there should be, there needs to be some incentive, which is more of a driver or motivator that has value, right? So those, those are the three, I think, components of a framework. And I really do believe um, that the solutions have to be tailored to your particular circumstances. If I look at my county, Alameda County in the Bay Area, you know, Oakland uh, borders Berkeley, but the populations are dramatically different. And even if I look within Oakland, there's a broad range of socioeconomic status within Oakland. Um, so we'll need to think about having, I think, multiple messengers um, and mm -hmm. messages. Um, I also think part of the challenge is, you know, not just the mistrust, but there's a lot of confusion going on, right? And, and rightly so. So let's take this notion of, you know, recently we hear that, you know, everyone's vaccine is now 95% effective. Right, and so, you know, what does that mean? That, that, those are actually based in really small numbers, right? So if you look at the Pfizer data in particular, you know, they're looking at 170 enrollees that developed, you know, symptomatic COVID, right? And that was confirmed by um, PCR test. Um, eight of those individuals were in the vaccine treatment arm, right? So you divide eight by 170, that gives you, that gets you like the 4.7, you divide that, you know, you subtract that from 100, that's how you get the 95. Right, and, every, and, and so I hear that, I'm like, that's, you know, a couple of hundred people. There's a disconnect, you know, so I'm thinking that, you know, you're saying that 95% of the people that participated in the study were effectively, you know, vaccinated. And that's not what the data really shows. So I think part of it is, you know, when I say there's this confusion going on, um, these sorts of uh, sound bites don't always help, right? Because when you drill down and I think, um, I think what people don't, what they assumed incorrectly, is that minority populations won't drill down on the information. Yeah. And I think the opposite is actually true. They are, they are just thirsty and hungry for information. And, uh, and I think we saw this. Um, so those are some thoughts, uh, maybe a little random, but uh, you know, a few thoughts, I think. Uh, Dr. Allison, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I, I just, I will co-sign on everything Dr. Garrick said, obviously. Um, not that he needs it, but with his experience trying to, um, long experience trying to in, in, engage um, and improve the representation in clinical trials, that's another important thing. So I think a natural question that doctors, physicians, local leaders, policymakers should expect from communities of color when, when and if you know, there is an, a safe and effective vaccine that's improved, approved is how did this perform in people like me? How did this perform in people like me? That is 
we have to have an answer for that. Um, and so I think that um, that is going to be when 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 we talk about drill down in the data, that is that is something we need to anticipate and have an answer for. And we need to be honest about that answer, right? And the answer might be we just, you know, we didn't do a good job of recruiting people of color to the study, so we don't know. Right. So I think you have to be completely forthright about what the results truly show. And that's gonna, you know, that will differ between you know, Pfizer, Moderna's vaccine and, or the other vaccines that are uh, being developed. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so just thinking about who's on the call for the local government uh, agencies on the call, how should they think about structuring research on how to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 and recover from the pandemic in a way that will advance health equity, ensure, ensure that programs that are meeting the needs of communities affected most by the pandemic? What are steps they can take to design relevant and impactful interventions and studies? So maybe uh, Dr. Allison first and then Dr. Garrick. Yeah, I think, um, I think the first thing is measurement. You know, of course, coming from J-PAL, we want randomization is, is important. It allows us to uh, strip away selection bias, but just make sure that even just making sure there are measures and measures from people that are impacted. Um, I think there was a question about, you know, in terms of the framing. Um, indeed, we did find that, um, and this is, uh, this is work that I think uh, is, is not yet um, published. So please kind of keep this, keep this between you and I, if you will. But indeed, we did find that the framing mattered that it was more we were it was more challenging to get people to answer surveys if there was a government frame front and center versus uh, working with a partner a research partner in this case it was Harvard um, but to get individuals in the door of a survey that did seem to help now if you put your incentive high enough your you know your survey incentive high enough you can actually it, you can include more people. And so compensating people for their time, meeting them where they're at, going to places that are not, you know, not necessarily putting flyers in mailboxes, but meeting people where they are, whether that be barber shops, flea markets, grocery outlets, um, you know, food shelves. I think that's a really a key piece. And, and just measuring how it affects their lives qualitatively, quantitatively, if you can randomize it, great. And I, I would add to that, you know, when we talk about this notion of community-based participatory research, you really need to engage the community, right? So, and it's not, an advisory board is not the answer, right? It may be a start, um, but it's not the answer. And I think we were successful in the study that Dr. Olson described, right? Because, and she mentioned this, we did a series of focus groups beforehand. We had a pilot before our main study, right? We hired individuals from those focus groups to be on the research team, right? So they were on the leadership team talking about making decisions with us. You know, not an advisory group that we went to after everything was decided to say, what do you think, right? And so I think, and, and, and I feel, in fact, I know, um, that we were able to ask better questions because of that, you know, that feedback and that, you know, those individuals being in the decision-making loop. Um, we got better, better data, right? And I think now the notion is develop, you know, disseminating that, that rich information we got. So that's, those are some thoughts, right? And you can't, you know, um, you know, it is really an advisory board or group, a community advisory group is I'd say at a minimum, a start. Um, I, I, I really believe, and I know that we were, we were impacted significantly and positively because we had individuals from the community on the research team helping us de with design decisions. In fact, uh, you know, something that came, we, we were, you know, very, you know, anecdotally thinking about where do we randomize at the barbershop level or at, you know, once individuals came to the clinic. Right, and that is something that you know, you know, me, Marcella, and Grant were thinking about, and so sort of noodling around as academics. And we got some really good feedback from the folks that actually lived in the community and that were in a research team and say, "Hey, this is what you need to think." So, it not not just answering and getting better data. It is it really did help with research design. Uh, 
Um, I'd love to dig a little bit deeper on, on working with the barber shops, and um, and and what did that take, and how did that, how was that developed, and then in terms of how you're communicating the results with partners and the community, um, do you have any recommendations from how re how researchers can do this? Any le lessons you learned over um, over time? So, Dr. Alsa, oh, Dr. Garrick, sorry, go ahead first. Oh, no, Dr. Austin, please go ahead. You can start. No, no, this was this was. Well, this I, was so, your genius. I'm gonna let you take this one. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure if it was genius or not, but I, I'll take I'll take that credit. Sure. The uh, so this this idea of recruiting at barbershops was, you know, when we think about it, when we look back at it, it's pretty straightforward, right? So we were looking at if you look at black barbershops across the U.S., uh, if you have hair and you're a black guy, you're there. Right, you could be well educated, not well edu educated. If I, if I look at, if we go to my barbershop, right? I'll be there with my kids sitting next to literally whoever is next in line, right? And that could be someone well educated, rich, poor, or not. And so you have this great diversity from a research subject perspective, right? So, you know, we went to, it's like the famous bank robber, they, he robbed banks because that's where the money was, right? So we went to these barbershops because that's where this diverse, patient or participant pool was and is. Um, and it, it crosses socioeconomic status um, and it crosses age, pretty much every category that we can think of, you know, for the group that we were um, looking to uh, um, research, they were there. Um, and they were there, you know, every one or two weeks on, on, a, re on a regular cadence. Um, now, that said, the notion of actually doing a research study in uh, a barbershop, you know, is, you know, has some logistical challenges, right? So where do you, where does a research coordinator sit, do the consenting, right? How do you fill out surveys? Um, you want to sort of be there, but not be in the way, right? And so those were some things we just worked through with trial and error. And I think the focus groups also were very, very helpful um, for us to think about some of those really, truly logistical issues, um, that we had to overcome and, and, and figure out. And I would just add to that, that this is, it's true leather economics. You know, it was Dr. Garrick and I walking around to barbershops. You know, a lot of, a lot of our shops, they're not on Google maps. They're not on Apple maps. <laughs> they are just there in the community. And so you have to find them by driving around, um, talk to the manager, figure out who's the manager, um, and I do think it helps to have a medical degree. I mean, there is, as Dr. Shine, you mentioned, there is a crisis of trust in experts that's kind of permeating our society, the United States right now. And I think some of it is from these, um, these conflicting messages and sort of this overconfidence that we project and then have to walk back from, it's not gonna come here and then walk back from, maps don't work, don't need them unless you're sick, then walk back from. And I think that that hubris <laughs> has really caused a lot of confusion. And of course, then the politiciz politicization of the messaging, but still there is, I feel like some power in having a medical professional, there is some willingness to work with medical professionals, but you have to, again, just it's it's the hard work of, of actually meeting people where they are um, and explaining to them what you're trying to do and understand having them provide really substantive feedback that you then incorporate and then that you can show. Um, because all of, what, all of what we're talking about with messengers and messaging, I mean, that that needs to be backed up by actually showing people that you're listening <laughs> to them as well. Um, yeah, and some, uh, and Dr. Austin, as you remember, some of the barbers said, no, they were just not interested, right? So. Um, and, and it was, you know, we were probably an interesting site going from barbershop to barbershop throughout the, the Oakland, Berkeley area. Uh, but most of them, the overwhelming majority were super interested um, and were engaging with us. And, you know, Dr. Shaw, to your point, your question about dissemination, it was very critical for us to go back, right? After the, you know, we had findings to say, hey, this is what we found. Because um, oftentimes, uh, you know, a, a common mistake um, from us as, you know, part of the research enterprises, 
we don't go back to the community to tell them, you know, what happened. I mean, not even to say thank you, right? You know, thank you. And here's, here's what we found. And, you know, your efforts, you know, produce these great results. Uh, and then, you know, there's also, we, you know, we tend to look for academic journals, right, to publish our results. And, you know, I think we were very lucky. Um, well, part of it was luck, part of it was, you know, Dr. Olson just, you know, being who she is. When we were gotten calls from the New York Times, Washington Post, Harvard Business Review. And so we talked to whoever was willing to talk, right? And we even, I remember I did an interview with um, the Daily Mail, the UK's version of TMZ, right? So the idea was, you know, our article, our study is going to be next to uh, an article about whatever the Kardashians were wearing at the Met Gala, right? So whoever was willing to talk to us, we were willing to talk to them. That was, I, I think, you know, we have to get out of our research or comfort zone to, uh, to be back in the community and to be and be comfortable with outlets that aren't the typical ones we might think about. Great. So we're starting to get questions from the audience. Um, thank you. And please uh, keep uh, entering uh, questions in the chat. Uh, so this is to both of you. I mean, vaccines are type of mind for all of us right now. Um, and in the light of the positive news on the vaccine front, is there literature on what makes for a successful messaging on a vaccine specifically? I don't know of any. Um, I, I would imagine there, well, I do know there's a lot of work around flu vaccine, right? So Dr. Alton and I actually very recently talked to um, uh, folks at the CDC adult flu program. So there's probably some proxy there. Uh, I don't know of it um, specifically, but I would imagine flu is, is pretty similar. Uh, or at least th there are some messages that you can take from flu uptake that could be relevant. And I think, doc and in fact, I know Dr. Alton has done some uh, research, you know, specifically, specifically in this area. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gear. That's a great question. So I think, um, so in economics, there's something called um, the prevalence, the, uh, the prevalence elasticity of demand for preventives. So as the prevalence increases, um, the demand for preventative care actually will increase as well. Um, and so actually, I think we shouldn't kind of take whatever, you know, the Pew survey might have said in March or April about people's willingness to get vaccinated and, and think about that right now. As the case counts are, you know, topping 100,000 year, you know, on a daily basis now, deaths that's about over a thousand to two thousand on a daily basis now. Communities, again, the disproportionate burden on communities. I think we should think about willingness to get vaccinated as a, as a dynamic thing, a fluid thing. Um, and so, um, so uh, some of the barriers to getting vaccinated from the flu may translate, but I think with COVID being as much of a threat the lives and livelihoods of communities of color right now, I think that um, there may be more willingness to get vaccinated for this particular product than there has been historically uh, for flu in the past. So I just wanted to mention that up front. What we have seen is similar things, the message, the messenger, it still matters, it still translates. Um, and people are worried. Uh, so when we were actually finishing up a flu study in March of actually in February of last year, and I was working uh, with a Stanford graduate student, we were looking at, again, uh, African-American men and white men all around the country. African-American men in particular had questions about the virus. So there is this hunk, I mean, this, it's actually very rational. There is actually, I think, a greater demand for information because they actually are seeing the results, feeling the results, um, you know, more nearly than than some uh, in the in the in the non-Hispanic white community. So there is this hunger and thirst for information, and so I think some of the what might translate more is the having trusted messengers and and messages. What might translate less well from a flu experience. Is just what's the overall willingness to get vaccinated? Um, uh, because I think we're in a different moment right now with the prevalence being so high and those communities being so hard hit. 
Uh, so there's uh, sticking to the vaccine theme, uh, another question from the audience. Do you have any thoughts on how communities might respond to a mandated vaccine versus an optional vaccine and how that may be related to take up? You know, so we have mandated vaccines, right? And most of, well, mandated, if you want to send your kids to public school or most schools, you have to get them vaccinated, right? Um, so I don't know. I, I, there'll certainly be some pushback, right? Because, you know, there's already pushback for wearing a mask, right? And um, sort of staying in your home or and, and social distancing. So I, I have to imagine there's going to be some uh, pushback if you mandate um, a vaccine. You know, my sense is, you know, we and to what Marcella was mentioning, you know, we're in such a crisis. I don't know if you need to mandate, right? And if you do mandate, you can't, you know, you don't have enough enforcement professionals to go out there and, you know, knock on doors and inoculate folks, right? So um, I don't know if, I, yeah, that's just my initial thoughts. Um, uh, I think we need to do a much better job a real job at communicating effectively. And we don't have to worry about mandates. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think I think there are select populations like healthcare providers and children, but I think for, um, I think there's so much we could do with the pull incentives instead of, you know, we could, we could bring in so many people if we make this free and freely available. And actually, you know, we could employ so many individuals that have been put out of work could now be community health workers, could be these trust ambassadors going out and forming people, um, answering their questions, telling them where to get inoculated, setting things up in primary schools and churches and synagogues, you know, making a good example of a mass vaccination campaign. You could look at the 1985 vaccination campaign in Turkey. I mean, they used mosques, they had, they involved the clergy, they involved uh, the, the education system, they had a consistent message that permeated throughout um, and, and everything was free, freely available. People didn't have to, ha you know, people could walk, they tried to make distribution centers within a mile, a mile and a half of every individual. Um, and it was, it was the first time really UNICEF's first success. So I think we can pull people in. Um, this can, again, this, the, the, the damage has been so devastating. I think where we're, the populations that maybe are big holdouts might not be the populations we anticipate. Um, it, it, I think, I think uh, if we make it freely available and we answer questions and explain things clearly, I think we can pull a lot of individuals in that way. And, and you know, to an earlier point, I, you, you do have to be honest about what the data shows, right? So you can't have this funny math and, you know, and, and shout a 95% number that's based on less than 200 people. Right, because folks see through that and you're not gonna get the trusted messengers to actually buy in and trust you and you know, you be a proxy of trust for you know, the vaccine manufacturers. So you really do have to have, you have to make sure that those individuals can maintain their integrity um, and you have to be completely transparent with them. Uh, and they will be in turn, I think, transparent with those that, in the community that trust them. Yeah, thank you. So um, just to add to this, um, there's some lessons learned from the HPV vaccine uh, that, um, that um, you know, pro uh, provide some of the evidence that Dr. Olson and Dr. Garrett just said is like, you have to build this trust before you could even think of about a mandate. So um, for folks who are interested, there's, uh, you know, some uh, literature around HPV that's probably worth looking at. And then um, Dr. Avi, Door from George Washington University has done some research around mandates and the different types of mandates and how that impacts uptake of, of, of school vaccines that may be interesting to folks as well. Um, but Dr. Allison, you talked a little bit about um, how to use community health workers to build trust in communities, especially about, around, uh, uh, around vaccines. I wonder if you could talk about, about how you use community health workers in this research to build trust in communities, how it could be relevant to, you know, vaccines or, you know, contact, tra contact tracing as well. Yeah, so um, we, Dr. Garrick and I actually, Dr. Garrick um, and his wife, who is also a physician, uh, Dr. Jocelyn Garrick, have been for a long time running a mentoring program 
for um, for underrepresented groups to um, to increase their representation in, in medical professional sciences. So we actually pulled from that uh, fairly large uh, population of, of mentees and use them as our frontline as a frontline workers who work. So students who wanted to go to med school, they were able to. You know, one of the great things about the study is we were able to write dozens of recommendation letters say that they worked at Stanford Medical School um, because we employ them uh, and they were our, the face of our research in, um, in the barbershops. In Minnesota, it's been extremely important to have a very good relationship with, uh, with the state uh, there, with the Office of Management and Budget, with the Department of, uh, the Department of Public Health, and they have a lot of connections to the food shelves. So without those connections, you know, we as researchers would be completely empty handed. So I think having, um, having you know, tentacles that, that are either, you know, the face of, of your study being individuals that are from the community and have our longstanding relationships with the community are extremely important. Remember Dr. Garrick and I got this question um, from Stanford, again, amongst friends, I can say this, um, you know, they wanted to do CT screening. The, the oncology group wanted to go around with a van in a CT, screen, CT scanner and just, you know, why aren't, why aren't individuals just hopping in their van to get screened for lung cancer? Um, and so, you, you know, that, that, that or, or, you know, or you just have to stop and think about whether these, how these things actually appear to individuals, what's the local context that we're working in. And um, even if we have the best intentions in the world, you know, we might, if we, if we, if we just come from Palo Alto into, into Oakland with our van, you know, that, that, might, that might not be enough. And, and I think that might be true for vaccinations. Well, if we haven't done the groundwork um, and just bring in the, the capital, that, that's not, um, I don't think that's necessarily sufficient. And, and Dr. Sharda, you mentioned uh, HPV, human papillomavirus vaccine, right? And if you look at the messaging for HPV vaccine, you see it's nuanced, right? They, there's an emphasis on prevention of cervical cancer um, versus the notion that this is actually, um, the, the virus is, is transmitted you know, via sexual activity, right? So there's this, this, long, this issue of, and you're, you have to, it's effective when you vaccinate uh, kids when they're 12, 13, and 14. And that's more of a, that's a difficult conversation to have with parents, you know, as a parent, hey, I'm, I'm vaccinating your kid at, you know, for a sexually transmitted disease versus, you know, this is a vaccination to prevent cervical cancer, right? So both are true. How, what you emphasize might be more relevant, right? So as we think about the message um, for COVID-19 vaccine, Right, the message might be more effective in certain communities. This this might help you get back to work sooner. Right, this might help protect your family versus you know the the scientific stuff about you know fighting uh, an actual virus. But I think we'll need to think through just like the folks that um, were successful with HPV vaccine. What is what are the messages um, and the nuance of those messages that might be most effective? Yeah, and how much information do you need from individuals when you if you do get them vaccinated again? heavily surveillanced communities, black and brown communities. Do you need every single detail of their, you know, of their income education, where they live, what not? Um, if you don't need that information, don't collect it. I mean, you need to know how they're feeling, what their views are, but if you don't need a ton of identifying information, just don't get that. In fact, we, a lot of people asked us in our Oakland study, oh, can you go back in two or three months, in a year? We said, no, we didn't get that level of contact information, we didn't need it. And we thought it would threaten the ability of people to be honest with us and to participate. So I think those are the types of decisions. You wanna know what they're feeling and thinking, but you don't need to know every detail of, of, their, of their existence and their financial situation and their history, et cetera. Thank you, uh, Dr. Allison and Dr. Greg for the, you know this practical, extremely useful, timely information. So let me end um, this panel by asking you, what keeps you up at night? In terms of, as a researcher, what do you think are the top of mind important questions to focus on in 2021? 
to advance health equity and address the persistent inequities in health outcomes exposed by COVID-19 and to recover from the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Garrett, do you want to start? I'll go first. We'll save the best for last with Dr. Olson. Uh, so I think we spend a lot of time researching what I call the, the demand side of the problem, right? Those that are that feel um, is, have issues of mistrust, you know, might be from different income classes. You know, it, we we look at it as what is their problem and how do we how do we help them overcome their problem? And I think there's also what I call the supply side, right? If, if there's a community that feels mistrust or distrust, there are actors that are that have a distrustful behavior, right? So we, as the research community, the medical community, um, the healthcare enterprise. Um, I think more research needs to be done in what we are doing wrong, right, and how we can do that much more effectively. Um, so for 2021, you know, more thought um, about that sort of uh, stuff, right? You know, so, you know, things like uh, figuring out how many um, health authorities have actually prepared and thought about how do we vaccinate, you know, our most vulnerable communities. And, you know, they, we should have been thinking about this for eight, nine months now. Um, and not begin to think about it, you know, next month. So those are some things that I, I think, you know, that keep me up at night. Yeah, wow, that was, that was brilliant. But I mean, there's many things. Um, I think what I've been trying to wrestle with is the, you know, the structural component of this, the fact that the healthcare system is not in isolation. There's an intimate connection between the healthcare system, the education system, the criminal justice system, um, the labor markets. I think practically speaking, we need to do a post-mortem on this epidemic and it needs to start right now. And we need to look at all the places where our system failed, sick pay, as you mentioned, um, insurance. How important is insurance for people that is not in tied to their employer? I mean, this is an externality, the fact that now we, we you know, have all of these things tied to whether or not you have a job and a crisis hits, and we have massive unemployment and how that affects people's ability to seek care um, and to control this epidemic. Um, and I think that goes on and on. Wi-Fi and the structural, you know, the fact that now we have all of these kids at, at home and some of them are, you know, crouching outside of a Taco Bell in order to, to get internet. It's just, these are things I think across all sectors, and these are these are there are things here. I think local and state governments can do, can take on. Of course, it'd be easier if it were coordinated and there was more money coming in. But you know, the sick pay, Wi-Fi, expanding Medicaid, um, and you know, and hopefully some someday we'll be able to negotiate pharmaceutical prices um, like every other country and regulate that market a little bit better. I mean, these are things that would have a massive impact on health inequality, I believe. Again, thank you to you both. Really appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk through these really important issues. And let me now turn it to Jessica Chow to um, close this panel and session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mona. And thanks so much to um, our panelists today for such a great and, and such a pertinent discussion. Um, and thanks to our audience for joining. Um, I have provided Hannah's contact info who leads our healthcare delivery initiative um, in the chat as, as well as mine and Rohit who, who uh, we work on our, the state and local innovation initiative um, contact info in the chat. So if you have any questions or comments or wanna get in touch with anything we talked about today, um, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to love to connect with you. Um, this is the um, final webinar in the in our four part webinar series, and that's focused on some critical areas for state and local governments to generate and use evidence um, and the importance of, of really approaching these questions with an eye on understanding population needs and prioritizing racial equity. Moving forward, the JPAL State and Local Innovation Initiative is really interested in pursuing uh, a lot of, you know, in pursuing evaluations and in these areas. And so we'd love to, we're really excited about the opportunity to work with state and local governments um, on the areas that we, we highlighted 
in the webinar. Um, if you've missed any other webinars, uh, I've also provided a link in the chat that uh, will take you to the recordings as well. Um, so please check that out. Um, I also provided a link um, to a new publication from the state and local team that summarizes the core research priorities from state and local governments and JPAL affiliated researchers. Um, it discusses some ongoing and completed evaluations in these areas and uh, outlines opportunities for future research. So, so please check that out. It's a very, very interesting document. Um, and I also wanted to flag some funding opportunities for state and local policymakers or researchers that work with state and local governments. Um, they're that are opening in this in spring 2021. Um, we're particularly interested in receiving proposals that kind of work on racial equity issues and health equity issues and um, and really thinking through uh, understanding population needs. Um, so the exact dates will be announced later this year. Um, make sure you're subscribed to JPAL's newsletter and our state and local innovation initiative mailing list to receive updates. Those are also available in the link that I shared in the chat. Um, and then one plug at the end of this call, you'll be receiving a survey and we would love for you to, to, to take a few minutes to fill it out so we can keep building on these webinars. Um, thanks again for attending today. If you've attended more than one, thank you so much for attending multiple webinars um, and thanks for being with us.